a big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about five essential photography skills that change my photos dramatically. Morning everybody, fantastic to see you all again. Well, I don't know if you've seen, but the volcano in Iceland has just started again, and I'm probably looking quite tired because I was up till the early hours of the morning just watching everybody's social media feed of what's happening there. It looks like there's like a 600 meter long fissure. Uh, my friend Jaron was there, who actually I was meant to be doing a workshop with in two weeks. Luckily, Mass has taken my place because I'm not quite ready to travel yet. Um, but um, yeah, Jerome was there and it looked amazing. I'll include some of his footage now. Oh my God, it looks amazing. It's this 600 meter long fissure and um, yeah, it looks like it's in a reasonably safe place as well. So it's not disrupting air traffic. It's not close to any um, infrastructure. So that's good news. Okay, so let's get on to photography skills that I think of massively changed my photography, my landscape photography over the last sort of 15, 20 years. And certain things that I've done and improved that I think have made a big step change in my photos. And I thought I'd share those. Um, there's five of them, um, not seven. <laughs> so I'm holding the camera at the moment. And the first one is gonna be all about the camera and I'll talk about that in a second. But at the end, I talk about lenses specifically. So stay around till then, because I talk about my favorite lens as well. Okay, so the camera is a really important part of that, I think. Everyone says the camera doesn't matter, but it's not so much what camera you have, but how well you know your camera. And there are certain things that I think everybody should be able to do on the camera. So often when I'm at workshops, and I've run lots of workshops, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people on workshops of all different abilities, there's always things about somebody's camera where, that they don't know. And that's like not great if you think about it, because if something's happening, like a big volcano's erupting, or um, you know, there's a rainbow, or you know, some light comes out on the foreground, you need to be able to react quickly. You need to be able to know how to use your camera really quickly. So here's a few things that I think you should be able to do with your camera. The first one is you should be able to exposure bracket with your camera. It's really important to be able to do that because quite often not everything fits in the histogram and you wanna be able to take multiple shots. So you should be able to do that really quickly. The second one is all about exposure again, but it's about the histogram. You should know how to see the live histogram. If you've got a mirrorless camera, you can put up your live histogram. So you should be able to see that and you know, you. It's a really important view that on the back of your camera. It's how I expose all my photos by looking at the histogram. The next one is you should be able to do a three to five exposure delay on your camera. So a timer on your camera. That's really important if you're on a tripod and you just wanna delay things so that it's not vibrating afterwards, especially if you're doing longer exposures. So being able to do that's really important. You know, Learn those three to begin with and that will set you up in the right direction. And finally, find out where the mute is on your camera. It really annoys me when somebody puts their exposure delay on and it goes beep, beep, beep. Basically, it just ruins the piece. You just don't want that. Okay, the next thing, and this, this one's a, a little bit counterintuitive, but composition failures are your friend. Everyone talks about this. Failure is the best way of learning, but it really, really is. You know, I often say, take your time with photography, don't take as many shots, sit down, have an apple, all those things matter. But when you're starting out in photography, oh my gosh, composition failure is your friend. You need to try and shoot as many different compositions. Then you can get back and see what's worked. You know, it might be that you're just trying different settings. Like these are shots that I found from 20 years ago of a waterfall where I, I was just experimenting with exposures because I knew I was gonna be hiking to a waterfall that might look good. So I found another waterfall, experimented with exposures. You can see here from, I think it was a 30th of a second to one second. I eventually took this of the waterfall that was one second. And that was, you know, me starting to experiment with things. Um, digital cameras are just fantastic for that. And then if you do get that composition, you get it back in Lightroom, try and 
tell yourself what you don't like about it. So maybe pick out one or two things you don't like about it. There's a good example that I remember, probably it was maybe 12 years ago, something like that. There's a photographer called Paul Newcomb and I used to really enjoy his photos and he took photos in the Peak District and there's quite a lot of foreground in them of rocks and they were really, really nice. And I went out and tried to take some photos like that and I ended up with these photos. I just wasn't happy with them. I tried a few different angles, it just didn't work. And then I just put his photo and my photo by, by the side of each other and I tried to understand why his photos were better. And then I realized that he'd gone been a lot more purposeful with his foreground. You know, he really thought about the foreground and exact rocks that he was gonna put in the foreground rather than what I was doing, which was just seeing, oh, there's some nice rocks there. I'm just gonna put them in the bottom of the frame. Whereas he'd sort of got lines that were nice. They were more dominant foreground as well. So that's, that's I think, really important. You know, and it's really good to compare your photos with somebody who you like and then try and spot the differences. The other thing that I spotted was his light was just a bit nicer as well. He always had really low light. And at the time, I think I'd gone out in um, about 10 o'clock or something rather than what I should have done, which was probably 7 a.m. Yeah, you know, I then went on to just love foregrounds and produce lots of what I felt were great foregrounds. And in fact, one of them is in my calendar this, this year, which is August, in fact. So, um, inspired by Paul all those years ago. There we go, it's this one here. This one here of the heather. Um, which I think looks really good and yeah, this foreground is really dominant. There's a really nice line leading you through and if you are looking for a calendar then there's still pre-orders and all the pre-orders anywhere in the world get free delivery and entry into a one-to-one -one draw with me where you get one of five one-to-ones. Um, and um, yeah, it's available for two more weeks pre-orders. The next thing that I think made a step change really in, in my photography and it was the skill of is it a skill? It's per perseverance, I suppose. Going back to the same location. And I feel like I do that quite a lot now because I've had so much success through doing it that I've just kept doing it. A good example is the River Brathe. So this was a shot that I took probably about 15 years ago of the River Brathe. I was walking down there um, with my wife and um, three kids. And um, yeah, we I, I took some snaps and I thought, oh, this is a good location. I started going back to it and I eventually started taking different shots. You can see that, you know, I got there with the mist. I found different angles, these groups of trees that were really nice. That was a beautiful morning. Then I found that if you went there really early in the winter, then it, you got this really nice glow there. There was often mist there and I got these beautiful sort of lilac shots there. And yeah, you know, these three different shots were taken probably five years apart, but they just look so good and it's because I've just kept going back to that location. I don't have to worry when I go there so much about the compositions, I just worry about am I going at the right time, what's the weather going to be like. It makes my life so much easier. Uh, you know, there's other examples like that of, of locations like that. There's one in the peak districts of these huts that I've been to so many times and in so many different conditions, the snow or the spring and just got different angles really. And it really elevates your photography because you start to see things that you didn't see before. Somebody who does this so well, who I greatly admire, is the amazing photographer Ben Horn from California. Um, his shots of Zion National Park and his video journals as well are just so amazing. He's been going there for over 10 years and if you look right back at his original video journal and his photos that he took there, they were probably the more iconic shops of the park. But then he slowly transitioned to these more hidden gems really, that were um, maybe more intimate scenes as well. And that's through getting to know those locations. Also, when you've gone to somewhere and you've ticked off those iconic places, then you can start to really explore a location. So I definitely recommend doing that. Also, go and check out Ben Horn's channel. He's a large format photographer, amazing. And his perseverance and patience are second to none. On to the next point, and that is something that it took me quite a long time to get right, I think, and I still probably don't get it right, and that is all about a lens and, and knowing what lens to put on your camera. As you're starting out, it, it can be quite confusing, you know, probably the most asked question that, that, that people send me through DMs and emails is, what lenses should I get for my camera? And I always say you probably should cover wide angle to probably 200 millimeters. But when you're approaching a scene, 
and you've hiked up a mountain or you've gone to a woodland and trying to find the right lens is difficult. The thing I'd say, the best way to look at it is you only want to include in the scene something that's going to add to the scene. So just because there's a big vista in front of you doesn't mean you've got to include all that vista. It's really important just to add in what actually benefits the scene, benefits that composition. Um, and don't leave the lens, don't be lazy and leave the lens that's just on your camera and get it out. You know, think about the scene. So for instance, this shot here, you could argue I could go with a 24 millimeter shot like this, but I feel like in this shot, it's better to tighten it right in and, and get a shot really close in on the hut. You still get the benefit of the branches. It just becomes a little bit mis more mysterious. You don't have the distractions of the sky. And I feel that yeah, thinking about that when you're deciding what lens to put on is really important. Um, the, the certain favorite lenses that I have, so you know, when I'm shooting in the mountains, then probably my 70 to 200 millimeter lens is probably my favorite. I like picking out details. And if I'm in woodland, then probably my 24 to 70 stays on my camera more than any others because I feel that's a really nice woodland lens. However, I am starting to use this 24 to 120 lens a little bit because that extra little bit of reach in woodland sometimes helps as well. But you can see by these shots here, you can use a range of focal lengths. This is all River Brathay, as I said before, and you can see I've gone from very wide to a longer lens in the same location. This is lit the, all these shots are literally I don't know, 50 meters away from each other. So there's always something. The final one is all about learning how to research your location. And again, this is something that I didn't used to do, but now wherever I'm going anywhere. So when I went to the Isle of Harris um, to record the masterclass uh, with my friend Rick, you know, we spent days just researching, looking at maps, looking at satellite maps, um, looking at weather patterns as well, you know, seeing what, where's the predominant wind going to come, where's the sun going to set, where's it going to rise, where the Milky Way is going to be. Uh, looking at maps, certainly Google Maps, Google Street View I find is really useful as well for where you might want to park. Also looking at different types of maps for that country, so like OS maps in the UK. And then just researching Instagram as well, and I don't tend to do this too much, but sometimes you find those little hidden gems and you might just think, ah, I wonder where that is, and then you might be able to find it on the map. Uh, you know, maybe somebody might tell you where a particular location is. You shouldn't copy people's photos, but they can certainly give you inspiration. So I think that's definitely worth doing. It's really, really good idea to do that research. And whilst I'm talking about maps, I've got an online map and it's my favorite locations. That is hosted on Squarespace on my website and Squarespace makes it super easy to do that. You know, if you've got a digital product, if you're selling prints or calendars like I just spoke about, or even, you know, you've got a book out like I've got Seascapes out at the moment, then Squarespace makes it super easy to put those things online. And also you can share, as a photographer you wanna share photos, you can set up a gallery, a portfolio. It makes it super, super easy. So if you're thinking of building a website, then check out squarespace.com forward slash Nigel for 10% off. That's it for this week. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed it. And until next Sunday, bye.